and welcome to Answers News for July the 13th, 2020. I'm Avery Foley. I'm here with Bodie Hodge and Dr. Gabriella Haynes. And we are so glad to be with you here today. We have a live studio audience here at the Creation Museum. If you guys want to clap and say hello. Let's hear you. We're so glad you're here. It's a perfect day to come. Weather is so great. We've been having such nice weather until it gets to the evening, and then we keep having thunderstorms in the evening. But during well, the day, the weather's been fantastic. Well, we had a plan <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. for the weekend for Saturday. Yeah, Gabby came over to our house for a barbecue, and it poured buckets and buckets, and there was thunder and lightning, and yeah, yeah. it was I'm a like, bit of a dud crazy as far as a in barbecue Kentucky. goes. I was <laughs> And like 30 minutes to go, a sunny and nice. Yeah, it was gorgeous. We were in the pool. It was amazing. And, and then, then let's grill some hot dogs and everything. And then, and then rain. It was like, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but we had fun anyway. We just hid uh, yeah, under a little just, shelter yeah. and until it was over. So it was yeah. fun. <laughs> All right. So as we get started here, um, as people are jumping on, we have kind of a fun science one to get started with here um, from New Scientist. Now, I picked this one specifically because I know everyone loves snakes. And the mm. idea of a snake leaping out of a tree at you uh, is just that uh. much better, right? So I knew people would love this one, which is why I picked it. Gabby thinks it's fantastic. Oh, my goodness. She loves it so much. So this is about flying snakes. Flying snakes don't actually fly. Like, they glide um, from, from, they'll glide from tree to tree. And they can actually glide up to 328 feet, which is really impressive, um, at a rate of uh, 32 feet per second. And so these scientists were looking at how they're able to do this. And because as you can see in the you video, the video they don't just, here. like, jump and then go straight. Uh, you know, their bodies don't remain straight. They undulate back and forth. And they were like... Why do they do this? So they found that Why? the snakes... Why do they do that? <laughs> Actually, will like flatten their, their rib cage out to make the snake wider, um, and they'll undulate back and forth. And if they really don't do that, then they won't make it as far, and they'll just fall right, instead they just of, kind of fall gliding out. back. Why right. would they anyway, fall? So. They don't die. <laughs> I'm sorry. You really don't like them. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, a snake is not bad enough. Oh, they fly. No. You know, it's interesting. He doesn't come out like a javelin. You know, we sometimes think of an arrow or a spear or something like that. They don't do that. But if you look carefully, the way that they actually bring their ribs together, it actually generates some lift as they're going down as well. And uh, I looked up; they actually go down at about a 20 to a 40 degree angle. And if you know much about aerodynamics, you know if you watch like a, a, an airplane take off. They tend to go up at a 30-degree angle. That's kind of your maximum up or your maximum down, uh, you know, to still generate lift. So they've got some of that going on. And the way that they move, if you watch their tail really careful, it's almost like the tail of an airplane. That's what's helping guide them uh, as they're doing this. And uh, I, I always love to see that motion and that effect. Uh, there really is some physics behind this. And I know the, the news article didn't go into all the detail of that sort of thing. Uh, but it really is neat uh, just thinking of some of the, like the, it's not really a gyroscope type of movement. You know, think of a circle, think of a top. Um, but when it goes back and forth like that, it's actually keeping itself balanced. Mm. And at the same time, it's doing some of those uh, gyrific effects, if I can put it that way. But it's really a neat thing. The engineer really liked it. I did. I liked it. <laughs> I did. I, I was looking up stuff left and right. The Apparently, paleontologist likes the fossil snakes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, the fossil snakes, right. they're dead, they're good, so it's fine, but no. Yeah. So there you go. You got to see the video yeah, twice it, it, just because how awesome it is. It just uh, yeah. remind me um, in one of the apartments that we lived right when I just got married. One time I was outside getting inside the car, and then I just saw like one of the snakes just like pulling, just like gliding from the tree down. I was like, what in the world was that? It was like, <laughs> this thing almost killed me. And my husband's like, no so drama, these, <laughs> it's fine. Where do these live at, actually? Are they down in Brazil, or where are they at? Oh, no, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Go, some, go, go to Australia. <laughs> yeah, go to Australia. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure. The, the, the yeah, article it's, it's didn't the say. the paradise snake. Yeah, so. paradise tree snake. So, uh, yeah, that's, that was our kind of our fun one to start with. Gabby loved it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our next one, um, a little further away from Earth. Um, <laughs> also from New Scientist, why icy moons like Europa are our best bet for finding alien life. So this was an interview with an astrobiologist, which is the only field of science to which there is absolutely, absolutely no, no evidence, no, evidence yeah. no data, because astrobiologist is basically someone who studies life on other planets, of which there is no known examples, so... Anyway, um, so they were interviewing him to talk about the, um, the potential of finding life on some of the icy moons that orbit some of the other planets in our solar system, like uh, Jupiter and Saturn. 
And he was mm. saying that he believes there's, based on some evidence, there's some oceans, liquid oceans, underneath the icy um, surfaces of these planets. So maybe there's life there because he got to go on one of those submersibles down to the bottom of the ocean and see the, hydro, the those uh, hydrothermal vents down there mm -hmm. and see the crazy, bizarre life that lives down there. And he's like, if life can live at the very bottom of the ocean in these conditions we would never think life can actually survive, then surely life can survive on these icy worlds out in our solar system. And surely if life evolved here, it had to have evolved there if the conditions are similar in, in you know, with liquid water, things like that, rich chemical oceans, things like that. Yeah, this is really just a book review on his particular book. Um, you know, as I look at something like this, you know, I, you know, just the title itself, why icy moons like Europa are our best bet for finding alien life. You, you know, our best bet uh, for finding alien life and finding out about that particular subject. It's actually from God and his word. Mm -hmm. um, there is no greater authority than God and his word. God knows all things. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said the earth was formed to be inhabited. You know, we look at these other places. They don't look like they should be inhabited. Uh, even uh, looking at Europa, it's, it, it's got hydrogen peroxide in there, you know, which is pretty vicious to, to things like bacteria and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like it's designed for life either. But see, there's this hope out in the secular world you, you got to find life somewhere mm -hmm. else so it's not special here. You know, mm -hmm. otherwise, it, it kind of points to that idea that, hey, this place is special. It's unique. And it is because God created life here and his son mm -hmm. stepped into history right here. And, on this and they planet. play a lot of the worldview right here because oh, yeah. uh, the idea that they have, oh, you need water, you need elements to build life, source mm -hmm. of energy to power. What about intelligence? Right, yeah, you know, the naturalistic right. assumptions How, how are you right going to get yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the, the intelligence, right. the design for everything to work? It's not only water. Water, it's not going to bring, right. you know, like something else. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm kind of yeah. getting scared of this water just coming up, <laughs> bringing something else <laughs> here. Right, yeah, you need a here. lot more than just You know, those, it's not you know, just water. Things, you're yeah. going to need a lot right. of things mm -hmm. to life. And, mm -hmm. um, but that's right. that world we're playing here because they don't believe that you need intelligence, you don't need uh, um, design for those mm -hmm. things to happen. They just believe that, oh, if you have water and some source of thing to power it, mm -hmm. you're going to have life. Yeah, you know, you know how yeah. unique Earth is? You go to one of the driest deserts in the world down in Chile, and guess what? They find microbes down there. Hardly mm -hmm. any water whatsoever for years and years. And, and what do they find? They find little microbes there. Mm -hmm. So Earth is definitely uniquely designed uh, God mm -hmm. formed it and he filled it. That's not a problem for an all-powerful God. Absolutely. Uh, he did this in six days. He rested on the seventh. That is not a problem whatsoever yeah. mm -hmm. for, for uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He talks about how eventually they'd like to be able to send rovers to these moons to actually study them and, and no, drill into cool. them. And Yeah, and he talks about how it would be a win-win situation because as I develop the tools, not only will that advance our capability of going out into the solar system and studying stuff, but it'll also increase our ability to go down into our own oceans because there's so much about our own planet that we don't know. Right. Every time they go down <laughs> to the bottom of the ocean, they find some new creature that they didn't know existed, right? Flying snakes um, at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <No>. not, but... <laughs> um, so, and as, as Christians, we can say, absolutely, yes, we should do that. Because as we go and we study what God has made, whether it's here on earth, we look out and we study creation. the bodies he's made out in mm -hmm. the heavens, we're bringing glory to him by studying what he's made. And as Christians, we should be directing that glory to him and saying, look what God has done. The heavens declare the glory of God. The mm -hmm. life here on earth um, declares the praises of the one who made it, as opposed to the evolutionary worldview, which says, look at all this here that just came this about chaos. by natural processes. And on these other planets, maybe we'll find something else that came about by natural processes yeah. um, and, and answer that question. Of, he, he talks here about it would answer a fundamental question, which is whether life arises wherever the conditions are right. And that's really where his hope and his excitement is in. It's maybe life just arises everywhere and we can change everything we know about biology by finding life somewhere else. And instead he's missing the signatures that are all around him of God in, in what God has created. Um, you know, DNA, it, just the language system of DNA screams for an intelligence and a designer, and he's missing all that because of his naturalistic assumptions about And here they define um, the life, of life as anything just working, but they cannot see life in a baby. Right, in the most, most secularist, yeah, yeah. 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 They don't see the life there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just, mm -hmm. it just crazy yeah. to see the difference between... You know, the inconsistence between mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. right, so Notice, we're... though, they, they oh. have to have liquid water. Liquid water yes. is almost like the hero. You know, they're mm -hmm. not looking at places that don't have, you know, any possibility of liquid water. But notice, mm -hmm. water is so essential to life. And, and even in the secular world, they recognize this. 
And this just reminds me, you know, even back in the Bible, you know, people were talking about how important water is, and here's Jesus playing off of that, you know, that he is the living water. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, you still see those kinds of connections, um, you know, even in Scripture. But, yeah, I, I, I really have high hopes, and I also have sad hopes for these types of probes because we're spending billions of dollars, and tax dollars, by the way, to go out here and to probe these places, and they're wanting to uh, spend most of that money trying to look for life. Why not look for other things and do other types of experiments and, and things like that? Mm. I would rather have a, a, a general accumulation of a lot of other types of knowledge than just trying to go out and look for life, especially if we're going to spend our tax dollars on mm-hmm. it. Yeah, it's something someone uh, said a comment here. I'm, I am on YouTube, and then... Um, Toby Emmanuel says, we haven't discovered all life on earth, let alone the universe. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. So well, be prepared know, to be really shocked by the next one, okay? Okay. It's shocking. Well, hold on just a second here, oh, Avery. Okay, we gotta um, hold off on the shock. Because the the you know, they're they're trying to compare this to the thermal vents. Right, you know, yes, and trying to say that that's the where the, the origin mm-hmm. of life might be a possibility, some similarities to that. Mm-hmm. We actually have a book called Glass House, and uh, one of the contributing authors in there is a chemist, a uh, PhD chemist, uh, Dr. Alan White. He wrote a chapter on the origin of life and how difficult that is. Even in the secular understanding, they cannot make sense of it. And uh, one of the aspects that they look at are these thermal vents and that sort of thing. So if you guys want to know more about that particular subject, uh, the book Glass House is what you're looking for. All right, awesome. Okay, we're ready for the shock now. All right, here's the shock. Dogs have always been dogs. It's oh, pretty wow. shocking. It's pretty shocking. I know. I That's prepared right. you, though. So this comes from Science Daily. <laughs> a sled dogs are closely related to a 9,500-year-old ancient dog. So this looked at uh, the genome of a dog that they believe to be 9,500 years old. Obviously, we know in a biblical time frame, that's not an accurate um, age for this. Mm-hmm. Um, that was found on a Siberian island. And they, they sequenced that genome, and they found that it actually points to a really early diversification for the different sled dogs that we think of, like the Huskies, the Alaskan Malamu, and the Greenland sled dog. So we think of, of those dogs. This one um, falls in with that group and shows a very early diversification for these particular Arctic, more Arctic type, um, type dogs. Dogs, mm-hmm. which really just shows the dogs have always been dogs. That's not a, not a real big shock, but points yeah. to the genetic diversity God created within, within the dog kind. Yeah, and if you just think about this from a time frame, uh, this is post-flood. Animals mm-hmm. have started to migrate to various parts of the world. These are actually related to some of the others that are up north. Go figure. We actually expect that from a biblical right, viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, these are, these are post-flood uh, uh, just variations within the dog. It's not a big deal. Uh, when we look at this. Mm -hmm. And they have some different adaptations that other dogs don't have. Like they have an adaptation to high fat diets um, because obviously you're going to have more high fat foods up in the Arctic where animals have a lot more fat in order to keep warm in a very Mm -hmm. cold environment, right? Um, And that, those adaptations just point to the genetic diversity that God created within the dog Mm -hmm. kind at the very beginning. And that was very advantageous for dogs that that are up um, in that area. And they found that that a lot of the people who live up there have those same adaptations to survive and thrive on a very high fat diet. Um, And so they say that these people and these, these dogs have adapted together. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's just pointing to the created diversity in, um, within hey, hey, our Haynes. own kind as well as the dog kind. Um, when it, you know, we, we use this term adaptation all the time. And, you know, the secularists use it, we use it, but we don't always mean exactly the same thing when we're talking a- adaptations. Usually, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, when we're talking about adaptations within the dogs, these are just some of those small variations within the dog mm-hmm. that they already have genetic variability for. But when the secular world's talking about it, aren't they trying to you know, make this as some sort of step for evolution. What oh, are your yeah. thoughts on yeah, some of that? Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing that I, I thought it was interesting here because they, they, they didn't really say evolution. Uh, I mean, like, the, the lab that they did is an Institute of Evolutionary Biology in Barcelona. Um, they use the word adaptation because all the time, the idea is everything that happened, like adaptation, mutation, um, that's all inside of the kind. What they right. think the evolutionist thing is like those mm-hmm. little changes in the kind over millions of years. Uh, to big changes. Made right. big mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, not, they but cannot. But we don't observe that. Right. No. What we observe yeah. is small changes no. within a kind. I think That's some, what we of, some of you just had like an amazing um, lecture. It was me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> about that. And it just like, um, it just shows that the, the fossil record, what we see in geology, does not apply 
to uh, what they think, to the mm. evolutionist uh, ideas, because that's not what we see. They cannot observe that, so they have to have faith to believe that that happened. So we were talking a little bit about that. But yeah, Bodhi, you're right. The idea that they have, it's always pointing adaptation towards evolution, but mm -hmm. that's not the reality of the fact. Yeah, so, so mm -hmm. basically, you know, all the dogs are part of one kind. Mm -hmm. There's just variation within those dogs. Uh, dogs yep. are dogs, but dogs are not related to hot dogs. Oh, uh, no. And they have you delicious guys hot, dogs hot dogs outside. You mentioned it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, all right. Think kind <laughs> is just in the level, like in taxonomy. The mm -hmm. kind is in the level of family. Sometimes it goes a little bit in order. Yeah, Sometimes it let it go, go uh, down in genus. But it's that level of family, just yeah, to usually, have an yeah. idea of taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, in the book Glass House, we actually have chapters on mutations and natural selection, some mm -hmm. of these types yeah. of variations in there. So. That book is really good. All right. This next item is a local story for here in our northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati region. It comes from um, uh, Cincinnati.com, The Inquirer. A therapist who violated Cincinnati's conversion therapy law, no longer an NKU teacher. So the city of Cincinnati in 2015 was the first city um, to basically put a ban on what they call conversion therapy, which is this idea where a counselor... Uh, they, there's a different views on conversion therapy on what it actually is. Usually it's defined extremely loosely. So it can include anything, including just a counselor who talks, who has someone come to them who has an unwanted same-sex attraction or gender identity, you know, um, issue. And they'll come to the counselor and be like, help me, you know, what, you know, and the counselor will show them what God's word says and, and help them through that. Uh, and that will often be lumped right in with this conversion therapy. They'll just call it part of that. And so they, uh, the city of Cincinnati basically said, you cannot advertise this to minors, to teenagers, to children. And this particular um, individual, Jerry um, Armelli, who runs the ministry called um, Prodigal Ministries, had an advertisement up just about his ministry, Prodigal Ministries, which helps people who have these unwanted same-sex attractions to help them to line up with what the Word of God teaches uh, and to help them um, work through that. And it was somehow came out that he had this advertisement up. The city sent him a cease and desist letter. He agreed to that, took the advertisement down. Well, people got really angry because he's an adjunct professor at one of our local um, universities, NKU, um, Northern Kentucky University. And uh, there was a petition that got started. It only got 133 signatures, which isn't even yeah, that many, no, but he was fired from being an adjunct professor at the school over this um, because NKU considers themselves to be an ally of the LGBT community. And anyone who does not jump on the bandwagon and affirm and celebrate is not in, a, in other words, not wanted. Not, you, you, know, you can help somebody go from being straight to a homosexual, but it is illegal to help somebody go from being a homosexual to be and, straight. And sometimes they don't even help, they push you. Right. Mm -hmm. if, if someone comes, like a teenager comes like, mm -hmm. well, I'm having some problems with a, a, a girl, with some boys. Oh, maybe you like girls. No, I'm just having problem with boys. You know, it's just okay. We mm -hmm. all go through all of this. Like sometimes we, we like that guy. We don't like that guy. So that doesn't mean that you like girls. Right. But in our culture, it's just this whole agenda is pushed yeah. so heavily and so strongly mm -hmm. on, right. particularly on young people. And yeah. making, mm -hmm. but at the same time, if someone is struggling with a uh, the being homosexual and they want to go mm -hmm. and have some counseling and have some, some, you know, mm -hmm. thoughts on, no, you cannot do that. That's not legal. Mm -hmm. You know, what gets me, you know, the most is here you have a public university that's supported with tax dollars that is taking an absolute stance on <gasps> secular humanism, that particular mm -hmm. religion, and mm -hmm. particularly under that sexual humanism, taking a stand saying, we will have people follow after LGBT, after this religious stance, and mm -hmm. we're going to oppose marriage. We're going to oppose Christian marriage. We're going to oppose Christian counseling in this sort of instance. And, mm -hmm. and yet, there's our tax dollars supporting that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And this you know, is really being anti-marriage is what it is. Yeah, and you know what I'm going to do? What Ken does. <laughs> That's what he does. Um, yeah, but it's it's really sad to see this happening where people are trying to help other people with the with the God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the transforming power of the gospel, and and the government and and others institutions and stuff are stepping in and saying no, you can't yeah. you can't do that. When really it's it's the Bible that and, and God's word, the gospel, that is the power of salvation, that is the power to transform hearts mm -hmm. and lives. And our culture has just jumped on this whole idea that 
that you'll find freedom and, and your identity in embracing this LGBTQ identity. That's where freedom and happiness and all that lies. And if anyone who stands in the way of that, well, they're bigoted, they're you know evil, they're in your way. Well, when, yeah, they, they call it illegal behavior. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah they call it right if that If you believe in, article, in marriage, you're... you're and you're that, trying that, to help people to, to follow yeah. God's word. But when we read God's word, um, for example, in the book of John, Jesus talks about how um, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So really what, what NKU and these other groups are doing is they're helping people People walk further and further and further and further into slavery to sin. And what groups like Prodigal Ministries are trying to do is help people get away from that bondage to sin. And, and Jesus goes on to say that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. You'll truly be my disciples and the truth will set you free. So he, they're trying to point people toward the truth that sets men free. And our mm -hmm. culture is, is trying to take people towards a lie that finds them further into In bondage the ministry, to sin. it's not pushing people to come, hey, come to me and I will change you. No, people that want to go, they're right, willing yeah. mm -hmm. to talk, and they're, they're open to mm -hmm. hear a different opinion. They are the one going there. The ministry is not making you go there. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah it's, it reminds you of Sodom, doesn't it? Yeah. As sad as that is to yeah. say. Yeah, so we need to be praying for groups like Prodigal Ministries that are trying to help and unfortunately mm -hmm. are getting into some trouble for their stand on God's word and the gospel of Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, pray for NKU, mm -hmm. pray for a lot of the people involved, mm -hmm. a lot of people who are trapped in this then. So speaking of what's going on in our culture, this next one is a poll from Gallup. Americans see divorce, fornication, gay relations as more morally acceptable than wearing fur. So... Yes, you heard that right. So this is a new study from Gallup uh, that looked at sort of the different beliefs of adults here in the United States, what they believe on a bunch of different issues. And they found that 54%, um, only 54%, think that buying or wearing fur is morally acceptable. That's compared to 66% of Americans would say that gay or lesbian relations are perfectly fine. 72% say that sex between unmarried adults is acceptable. And 77% say that divorce is morally acceptable. But only 54% think wearing fur is acceptable. It's just, wow. And as you dive deeper into the study, you find like it's so inconsistent. The, the, the inconsistencies of a culture that bases its authority on man and so, the ever-changing so opinions work. of man is just, yeah, because yeah, as you get into this, you see that 44% of Americans think abortion is morally acceptable. So 44% think the killing of an unborn child in their mother's womb is acceptable. But only 18% think suicide is okay. Okay, so why is it okay to kill an unborn child, but not okay to take your own life? In a secular view, that's, that's extremely inconsistent to say it's okay to kill this person, not okay to kill yourself. But in a biblical worldview, we can say both are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, we have God's word, which says, do not murder. Do not murder yourself. Do not murder other people, right? So we can be consistent on that. They can. Um, and if you read through this, like, they say that 36% of Americans think that um, viewing pornography is acceptable, 36%. But only 9% think that married men and women having an affair is acceptable. Okay, so it's 36% think it's acceptable to go online and watch, you know, erotic videos, images of people. But only 9% think it's okay to actually go out and act on that with other people who are married. So again, it's extremely inconsistent, right? Um, and that's just what happens when you have a culture that does not have an absolute basis for their moral authority. It's just everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And you get this, this um, subjective morality that changes with each person, each subsequent gen genera generation, as opposed to God's word, which is the authority that never, never changes. changes. Yeah. And there's my little, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> I'll let you guys do some talking now. <laughs> okay. That was great, AJ. Yeah, you really point out the, the, the things that are important because when I was talking in the, in the, in the lecture here, it, it's, it goes men's word and God's word. There's mm -hmm. no other way. So if you, have, you have to choose where you're going. Mm -hmm. God's word or men's word. And, and when you go with men's word, men's word, it just goes with these chaos. Yeah, it's yeah. so inconsistent. It's so inconsistent that they cannot mm -hmm. agree, and I think it just like brings confusion. Mm -hmm. Totally yeah, confusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most of the people probably polled on this were probably wearing leather shoes or have some leather shoes at home. <laughs> you know, I yeah. find that kind of interesting. Um, but here's something else I notice. You know, there, there. There's this concept, oh, well, you can't hurt animals, you can't hurt animals, you can't hurt animals. And then they turn around, the, the same people are saying, abort children, abort children, they're just animals. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You see, I mean, there's a double standard within all that. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that we should hurt animals. It's not, we have to take care of God's creation too. Uh, but 
it's just to show the inconsistency mm -hmm. of between yeah. those two things. It's like some of them, I think we talked here on Answers News talking about the tree that they were going to give right, right. to person a tree. To yeah. tree. Yeah, yeah. person to hold, person to hold to person a tree. Yeah. Hey, one, one of our top fans online here, Craig, says we are getting further and further from the truth. <laughs> hey, I'm going to give him credit on that. That was a good one. That was a good one, yeah. <laughs> Craig's listened to you too much. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, if, if could you wear clothes made out of flying snake? Oh, no, goodness. please don't talk about this anymore. Another, one, another thing I thought was interesting <laughs> in this study was, was that they 66% said that you know, um, homosexual relations were acceptable, but only 20% agreed with polygamy. And again, why do you draw an arbitrary line, right? If love wins, right, that's the talk of our culture today, right, love wins, and you can have two men or two women, then what's the difference between redefining marriage to include three, three four, or five, four ten. or five, right? It's completely arbitrary, as opposed yeah. to God's word, which defines marriage as between one man and one woman for life, right there at the very beginning in Genesis 127 well, in and fact, Genesis 224. in fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, the very first kind of skins were, mm -hmm. were, were clothing. Right. God mm -hmm. sacrificed mm -hmm. animals in Genesis 3.21 to make coats of skins because the punishment for sin is death. So there's a relationship between human sin and animal death. Right. In fact, mm -hmm. that's ultimately why Christ had to step into history to take that infinite punishment we deserve from yep. an infinite God, which is what makes salvation possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. But of course, the power in it is Christ, unlike mm -hmm. anyone else or unlike those animals, you know, not not only did he lay in the grave, he came out of the grave. And that's the mm -hmm. power in the resurrection right there. Absolutely. Shows he has power over life and death. Absolutely. All right, this next one comes from Eureka Alert. Milk lipids follow the evolution of mammals. So this is talking about the different kinds of milk that various mammals produce. Uh, they, looked at the, uh, they looked at human breast milk and they looked at... Okay, um, I just want you guys to know up front, I feel way out of place because I got two, <laughs> two mothers right up here in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe we're in this. Yeah, yeah the, I picked this one. Um, <laughs> the title itself, the title itself, Milk Lipids Follow the Evolution of Mammals. It's like, if you see a milk lip, lipid like following something, run. <laughs> because this is something wrong going on here. It's like, they don't follow anything. They're not I want people. you guys to understand, we're going to milk this for all it's worth. Oh, so. my word. <laughs> uh, another one. Okay. So they looked at the milk of uh, human breast milk as well as two species of macaques, cows, pigs, goats, and yaks. And they compared the lipids that make up these various milks mm -hmm. to look at the composition of them. Um, and what they found was, so they, they basically, they, they looked at the milk on this, this, this you know, very close level. And then they looked at the, what they call the known evolutionary distances between species. In other words, the distances they're assuming between these various species and how closely related they are. And what they found was the majority of samples, in their view, displayed a good match, which basically just means that similar creatures make similar milk, right? That's not really, that shouldn't be very shocking, right? Yeah. It's not very surprising. But they get on it, and, but then they go and talk about how that's kind of not really the case because they're like, we expect there to be a difference between cow milk and monkey milk, right? You'd expect there to be a difference between those two. But they're like, in an evolutionary worldview, Monkey milk and human milk should be fairly similar, right? Because we're supposed to be evolutionary Related. cousins. Yeah. Big mm -hmm. shock. Monkey milk and human milk was really different. It was not that similar. And they're like, well, it must be because humans have um, very advanced brains. And so we need certain compounds in order to grow those brains that monkeys don't need because they don't have those brains. So it's really amazing that evolution managed to produce the <laughs> right kind of milk that humans needed in order to evolve the right kind of brain because you can't have one without the other. I mean, imagine to the quote dumb Dr. Metton, imagine the dumb luck, imagine right? The dumb that luck. could somehow manage to get those two things to evolve at the same time in order to be able to produce what so monkeys it, need and what humans it's need. It's not about the evidence. It's because it's they're the always mm -hmm. using right. the worldview to interpret what they want. Because if it doesn't go the yeah. way that they want, they'll be like, oh, it's because of the brain. Oh, it's because they needed something else. It must have, it has to have, yeah. you know, that's the mm -hmm. worldview playing right there. So, is mm -hmm. it glasses so, that you that used to interpret absolutely. everything? Absolutely. So humans that grew up on cow's milk or goat's milk, do they have bigger brains and littler brains? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> ah. um, so, um, so you look at this and you look at the different composition of the different kinds of milk and, and you see how each one is tailored mm. toward a specific creature. And really what you should be seeing is this is uniquely designed. It's uniquely designed to give that creature exactly what it needs. And mm. it points to the handiwork of the creator, not to somehow evolution managed to, yeah. to 
to have the dumb luck to figure out that it yeah. needed this at the same time that it was evolving a bigger yeah. brain. Amazing grace of God and mercy to give mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. what we need, you mm -hmm. know, even when we cannot do yeah. anything, just a little baby cannot do anything, cannot protect themselves, but God is just like providing mm -hmm. food and, mm -hmm. and everything you know, for that the big kid. picture. The big picture on this particular article is they're using evolution and assuming evolution to try yes. to argue right. for evolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's actually an affirming the consequent fallacy from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so I thought this article was really just so cool, pointing to God's unique design and how it just goes against the evolutionary expectations mm -hmm. uh, and really points to, to God's incredible design, even in something that, you know, we don't we often just take for granted, don't really think about. God's design is there. It's it's evident, and it points to the the account of Genesis being true. It's real history, not the evolutionary story. All right. So this next one is just one kind thing. Of, oh, I didn't like that you picked those articles because one has a snake flying. Now you have a a tiny dinosaur that can bite your hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I thought. It was so fossils reveal dinosaur forerunners smaller than a cell phone. So when we think about dinosaurs, we typically think of the really big ones that get all the attention, right? T-Rex, Brontosaurus, Triceratops, you know, the really big ones. Uh, and as we've pointed out for years, not all dinosaurs ones. are huge. A lot of them were small. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were the size of chickens. The average, when you take all the big ones, little ones, put them all together, about the size of, of a bison, a large horse, you know, somewhere in around there. But lots of them are really little, including this one which was just like pocket size to about yeah, four inches tall. Yeah, this one definitely tall. brought the average so just down. <laughs> so tiny. And the researcher points out that it was probably would have made a good pet. Can you imagine if these hadn't gone extinct? Like every kid would want one of these. The, the name it <laughs> translated is Tiny Bug Slayer. The, so they're, they're called Conganafan Kelly. I probably butchered the Latin on that one. But it means Tiny Bug Slayer. You can see every kid like, Mom, can I have a Tiny Bug Slayer? Can I have a tiny? Everyone would want yeah, one for their to, terrarium just, in their bedroom, right? Just to put right? your finger right there because you're going <laughs> to be without it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, but they call this a dinosaur forerunner because of the age they assume of the rock layer that this mm -hmm. dinosaur is found in. So this one made the news headlines simply because of its scale size, huh? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So a couple <laughs> people got that. Most of you guys. Uh, actually, though, if you look at this Just fossil, they, worse, they the found it in Madagascar. And in the secular world's idea of, the, of their dating system, they put it at 237 million years ago, which is imaginary time. This is mm -hmm. flood sediment. That's all it is. This thing was buried the same year that T-Rex, Stegosaur, Brachiosaur, mm -hmm. and all these mm -hmm. others were buried uh, uh, about 4,350 yeah. years ago at the time of the flood. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is they have this mindset that there were no major catastrophes back in the past. These different rock layers are laid down slowly and gradually over millions of years. Mm -hmm. And this one, therefore, is a precursor to so many other dinosaurs uh, mm -hmm. later on in the fossil record. But you know what? When you look at it from a biblical viewpoint, it makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. You know, the yeah, majority right. of the rock layers are from the flood. We've had some since then. But mm -hmm. by and large, this yeah. is this it, is a count They the say here, of course, no humans were around when this dinosaur was roaming in the wild. Uh, Except well, for Noah floating around <laughs> up above it all. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. His family. Again, when you look at this, through the, they're, this, they're looking at this, um, this fossil through the lens of an evolutionary worldview. We would mm -hmm. look at the same fossil through the lens of a biblical worldview. And we'd yeah. understand this is a land creature. Land creatures were created on day six of creation week. Adam and Eve were created on day six of creation week. So, uh, yeah. the dinosaur kinds lived at the same time as Adam and Eve. Um, mm -hmm. And then they were buried during the flood. Two of every kind survived on the ark. They got off the ark into a very different world. Um, the flood is followed shortly thereafter by the ice age. Many creatures couldn't survive the, the rapid changes in the, in the environment, in the climate, and many of the different kinds died out, including, unfortunately, the dinosaur kinds and this little guy. Um, but who knows? Maybe before the flood, people did keep them as pets. Who knows? Okay, so, so I'm going to leave you with this because Craig yeah, came back with a good one. He oh. said, it, this is talking about the milk one. If evolution took a wrong turn, it would be an utter disaster. <laughs> oh, my. All, all right. Well, on that note, right. thank you, Craig. We will <laughs> end today's episode. But God we will be back. Uh, another team will be back on Wednesday. So we hope you can join us then. Thank you. Yep. Enjoy your day. Thank you all for coming.